Welcome to all the agrupados and congregantes for the third of three videos that we have prepared in anticipation of our 90th anniversary and the upcoming assembly that we have. My intention tonight or today, depending on when you're seeing this video, is to cover the Jesuit preferences, explain them, how they relate to our planning session, to remind us all of the pillars of the Agrupacion and share some uh, testimonials uh, to hopefully inspire our call to action as we begin to discern and plan for the next 10 years of the Agrupacion. So the Jesuit universal apostolic preferences, as the name implies, are true to all Jesuit organizations around the world. These Jesuit preferences are intended to provide a horizon and give a point of reference for the entire Society of Jesus. They are intended to capture our imagination and awaken our desires. These preferences are intended to unite us in our mission. These four preferences that we're going to learn about that were released a couple of years ago were a product of two years of discernment and received validation from Pope Francis, confirmation from Pope Francis, after a formal letter that came from the Father General of the Society of Jesus. The four preferences as they are written include showing the way to God, walking with the excluded, journeying with the youth, and caring for our common home. With these universal apostolic preferences, the Society of Jesus is trying to concentrate its apostolic efforts over the next 10 years. Very similar to what we're trying to accomplish with the assembly of the Agrupacion, we are looking at a 10-year horizon to try to see who we can become, fulfilling our mission through our pillars, and hopefully integrate some or all of these preferences into our planning. So now let's focus on each one of these four preferences. Number one, showing the way to God. Over the next 10 years, we want to share with others the most fundamental discovery of our own lives, our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Our intent is to help people find Him and to live in His way. We want to try to accompany people as they discern complex choices in the social, economic, cultural, and political spheres. And we want to help create environments that favor free personal processes independent of social or ethnic pressure. We also want to promote in-depth study of the spiritual exercises, which as we all know is very much aligned with the Agrupacion. And we want to give the exercises in places of social exclusion so that people will know they are part of one family in solidarity with one another and with our Creator. Apostolic preferences number two and three appear to be aligned with our apostolic pillar. Number two, walking with the excluded. The Jesuits desire first and foremost a conversion in our own hearts, being alive and sensitive to the suffering Christ that's in our midst. Our communities desire to be more hospitable and open, learning how to live more deeply in the spirit of Jesus, a spirit that welcomes. Related to formation, this preference includes working with universities and with others to engage in profound study of the world's economic and social issues. It also calls us to work in education at all levels to make people aware of the burning need for reconciliation, many of whom are estranged, vulnerable, and alienated, asking us to look outward. We want those who are part of our educational mission to dream and to build step by step a new culture based on gospel values. This preference is asking us for a commitment to promoting a healthy and safe environment for children and young people to stand against abuse of all kinds. Through our work, we are called to unite people where they are separated and to heal them where they are wounded. Number three, journeying with the youth. Young people have so many possibilities in this digital age that unites them as never before. We wanna walk with them, discerning their possibilities and finding God in the depths of reality. 
Accompanying young people puts us on a path of conversion. It requires a new way of living in Jesuit community, a way that is more coherent, more personal, more open, and more evangelical. We want our apostolic works and houses to be spaces open to youthful creativity, where the encounter with God and revelation of Jesus are deepening the Christian faith and fostered. We want to help young people to know Jesus Christ and feel loved, saved, and forgiven. Through our schools and universities, we are asked to work together with the parishes to help the development of faith, especially of young people, to creatively adapt the spiritual exercises so that younger people can personally know Jesus in ever deeper ways and follow Him more closely. And the last preference, number four, is caring for our common home. At this vital time in our world's history, the Society of Jesus commits itself to answer this call of our Creator over the next 10 years. One way to do that is through centers of higher learning, identify areas where we can make a difference and contribute to a change of mind and heart. The Jesuit social centers will study root causes, collaborating with higher education sector and others who share this concern. Schools can make sure that new generations are made aware and can integrate this issue together with their faith. Spiritual and pastoral centers, parishes, and chaplaincies can work together to highlight awareness of God's call in this area. So as we can see, several of these Jesuit apostolic preferences are aligned with the mission, the pillars, the purpose of the Aku. Just to be clear, we as an Aku community should strive to reinforce these ideas and support these efforts. We are not trying to redefine our mission, redefine our pillars, our identity, who we are as an organization because of these preferences. So as we dive into our planning assembly as an Aku community, our intent is to see where we can align with these preferences, although we do not have a requirement to meet every single one to the letter of the law. Having said that, I thought this would be a good time to reflect back on our mission and the three main pillars of the Agrupacion that have stood the test of time by reflecting on some personal testimony that could inspire us to plan for the next 10 years. It gives, it gives me at least a lens through which to look at the world, look at my reality, and look at and help discern what God wants of me. Right. And at first, I was like, you know what? I I I don't know this. I don't know this is going to work for me. <laughs> first, the first one, even even the second one. But then, you know, you 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 learn to hear God. And I think that those of us that that um, all of us now today. I mean, whether it's because of social media, families, our jobs, everything. There's just, there's no silence in our lives. And it's just a lot, a lot of noise. I know I, for one, you know, my job, I was constantly busy, constantly, you know, constantly on the road. And, and the spiritual exercises provide that silence, that once a year moment for you to go and say, okay, you know what, let me take care of the most important thing, which at the end of the day is my relationship with God, right? And the agrupacion, we believe in, Dios, familia y trabajo, you know, and a God, uh, family and work, right? For me, I've experienced what it, why they're called exercises because, you know, you do them every year and I've been doing them you know, for 20 plus years now and every year it's, you get better, but you walk out saying, okay, I could do better, I could do better next year. So I came down to those spiritual exercises on the invitation of these guys who had become very good friends and through whom I had discovered that um, Spirituality didn't necessarily mean a bunch of prayers in a, in a, in a dark room, you know, it was, uh, you could um, have a couple of beers with your friends one night and the next morning be saying mass in the mountains with, uh, with one of the priests from the Aku. Um, so I had already kind of woken up that sense that spirituality could be manly and normal and, and, and enjoyed with your friends. Uh, as opposed to some, you know, beatific kind of activity. So I went to these spiritual exercises that these friends of mine invited me to, 
And it was there that I discovered that I could actually have a real relationship with Jesus or with God. Um, and that if I made that relationship the center of my life with my friends, it would give us a common bond um, so that our individual spirituality would actually contribute to a group spirituality. Um, and that was what most attracted me to the Agrupacion. As a matter of fact, it was as a consequence of going to that retreat um, to which some of my friends went with me that I realized that what we needed in Atlanta was not some kind of club or association, but we needed something like the Agrupacion, where we would grow together in spirituality individually and then make up this, this stronger unit. Um, and, and Ignatian spirituality was very attractive because it was manly, it was aggressive, it was um, in defense of the church, um, it was personal in its relationship with God. Um, and as soon as we all got together in Atlanta after that retreat, we realized this could be uh, something much more meaningful than we had ever thought. Um, and that spiritual connection could last a lifetime. The first significant emotional experience that I received was like a passion. I came from a family that was not practicing. I didn't go to a Catholic school. I, was, I went to a private school. And then I entered in La Agrupación and suddenly my life was sent upside down, completely for the best. I went to my first spiritual exercises in 1958 when I was 16. I was a senior in high school. And at that point, my life changed completely. And then that gave me uh, the path for getting to know Christ as my friend. I always had my version of God being my sins and maybe being forgiven and praying again and going through the same thing everybody goes through. In this case, I discovered the person of Jesus and Jesus was my brother. I, I could imagine him going like this and talking to him, hey, can you help me now? So the life of Agrupacion spiritually changed my life completely and I have been carrying me since 1958 to this point and I'm very grateful to God for this gift to me. So the idea of being a real professional and improving yourself uh, was stuck in my mind. And the day I graduated with my bachelor, after the graduation, my father gave me a big hug and a kiss. And the first question he asked me was, when are you going to go for your PhD? And I said, Papi, please. I just went through four years and I've sweated it. He says, well, remember that one day you're going to be in front of Jesus. And are you going to tell him that you buried your talents? So if you have talents to continue, I think you ought to consider doing that. And that drove me a year and a half later to go back to graduate school and get a PhD in chemical engineering. Then meet uh, an agrupado and he starts talking to me about La Agrupación, the hook was a formation. So, because I was already uh, a member of a parish group, but he was meeting here and there, and, and, and I was on the search. I was looking for something more. And when he talked to me about the formation, so I'm like, okay, this is exactly what I'm looking for. If something sets the ACWO apart from many organizations in the Catholic Church for lay people is the strength of its formation. And a number of agrupados have commented to me and said, well, I'm, I'm a member of the Cursillos de Cristiandad, or I'm a member of this other organization, and they're very good, and they, are, they do a lot of good for the church. But what distinguishes this group uh, is the strength of the formation. As a Catholic, uh, the more you know, the better you can appreciate what we have. So the more we know about Jesus, the more we can love Jesus. The more we know about Mary, the more we can love Mary. So our formation is, it helps in our personal life in a very special way. When it comes to the professional life, 
be the best professional that I can be. But what does that mean? Is, is you know, demonstrating Christian values, the values of Christ, Christ at work. You know, so not separating your personal life from work, rather, you know, you're a Christian in all, in all facets. And, and from, from my profession, for example, I'm, I'm in the, right now I'm in the sales profession. And in the sales profession, it becomes, you know, this, this game of how do we convince a customer and sometimes tactics, some, you know, some tactics, tactics are used that are not really, let's just say, ethically or even morally, you know, to, to a level. So one of the things I try to do is, look, let's, let's you know, always be honest with, a, with, with your, all your dealings. And, and so one of, the, one of the things that's really important to me is if I'm going to say something, you know, do it also. Like walk the talk, you know, not, not just, you know, hey, I, t- I, do, I talk like here and then do something else. That's, that doesn't work out. But more importantly also is, you know, that interaction with the fellow employees. And, and you're going to deal with all different types. I deal with all different types of, fe- of workers. And I've had to learn, you know, that not everybody necessarily agrees the way I, I see things or maybe mine have my same values but respecting every human being for who they are and for, and for being God's creature. And, and then lastly, you know, acting and, 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 and making ethical and moral decisions whenever we can at work. And uh, the apostolic work has obviously been very important foundation of, of the agrupacion. I had the good fortune very early at a young age getting involved in a detention ministry under the tutelage of uh, Yoi Betancur, a very well known uh, congregante. I did it for about three, maybe four years or so, and I had to stop because uh, my wife got uh, cancer, so I had to tend to that. Uh, thank God everything worked out fine. And then after that, we started having children, and we, one reason or another, I had every excuse not to do the detention ministry. A uh, few years after that, I started thinking and pondering and discerning whether or not to get back into detention ministry. And sure enough, the day that I started praying about it, I was at my parents' house for dinner, and my mom showed me uh, something I had in a Ziploc in my room when I used to live at their house. It turns out it was a gift that I received from a prisoner. It was a, a piece of his pillow that he had torn off and, and done a, a piece of artwork uh, signed by several of the prisoners in the same unit thanking me for the ministry that I had done. So I said, wow, just, just as I'm praying about whether or not I should get back into this, I see this sign. The next day, it was actually three, the very, the very, very next day, I was preparing a talk, and I'll never forget, I pulled from my library in my office, Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Catholic Church. So I grabbed the book, and out falls the business card of the chaplain from the prison I used to serve, with name and phone number and everything. So it was right in front of me. Two days in a row, I get these signs, and then the very third day after I was pondering this, a friend of mine, calls me and says, hey, I know you used to do detention ministry several years ago. Uh, How do I get into that? So I pray about it. I think about it. And I see three days in a row, you know, this God incidence of very clear signs asking me to re-engage in this ministry. So, you know, pre-COVID, it was very easy for me, even the days that I didn't want to go, didn't feel like going, uh, could make every excuse not to go to fall back on the memory of that and, and the apostolic mission that we're called to as agrupados that have thankfully to this day uh, maintained my connection and my activity with the detention ministry program. As all things in the world, in life, that have balance, that need balance, like a table has legs, a stool has three legs. In the agrupación, the balance is in life is attained by balancing your spiritual dimension, your service dimension, and your continued education dimension. That's how you attain the balance of your life. Shortly after I became an agrupado, Father Llorente approached me and told me that he wanted me to take over the apostolate of the radio program that the Agrupacion had in Miami-Dade County. I I was very happy, I was excited, you know, the 
best honor is to serve and I was going to have a chance to serve the Lord. And uh, then I uh, was given a date, uh, and a time and a topic, and I needed the next step was for me to meet the team of agrupados that were doing this for a long time and the team of the radio station. And at that time, the programs were life. So there was no room for mistake, no room for vacillation. Uh, it was life. So when I got the topic, I went home and I prepared for it for a long time. You know, I wrote a paper, a two page paper of what I thought would help me to participate. And when I showed up at the studio, I found myself surrounded by this legendary agrupados. Tete Mestre, Manolín Hernández, Carlos Gastón, Javier Casas. They showed up there and they didn't have any notes. Just a little piece of paper with a couple bullets. Life. And they went through this fantastic discussion about the topic that I had never read, heard before. And I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit there in that room. And I realized then what apostle it was. So when you put together your knowledge, your professionalism, uh, your spirituality of many years in the Akko to serve the Lord. So I really hope some of those testimonials about the pillars and the mission of the Agrupacion were helpful for each one of you to look back at your personal lives and the experience that each one of you have had in the Agrupacion and think about some of the memories that you have that have inspired you to live life through this consecration that we all share. Looking back at your own experiences of fulfilling the mission of the Agrupacion and its three pillars, I hope that this will help you consider the next 10 years of the Agrupacion. As we prepare for this assembly at our 90th anniversary, I want to challenge each of you to look forward at how we can inspire future generations to have some of these same shared experiences. As we look forward and plan for the next 10 years, I challenge each of you to consider beyond the horizon what the Agrupacion can look like at its 100th anniversary and what incremental steps we need to take as an organization in order to get there. As a community, we are called upon to discern some of our thoughts and our prayers and our desires for the Aku together as an organization. And our discernment begins with our planning. I ask that we use this opportunity as a call to action, a call for us to strategically consider how we as an organization and each of us as individuals can make the best use of our God-given time, talent, and treasure to continue moving forward this organization for generations to come. I thank all of you for your time and participation, and I look forward to seeing you at the 90th anniversary celebration.